In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Well, it's Friday night. It's football season. And uh, that's more important than the Word of God, obviously. So we'll continue with the serious people who listen on the Internet and the ones who are here. So uh, we are dealing now with the ten problem-solving devices versus the defense mechanism. The ten problem-solving devices versus the defense mechanism. First of all, we have rebound. And what happens with the defense mechanism is self-justification and self-deception instead of rebound. Instead of naming your sins to God, you justify what you've done. You had a right to be angry. You had a right to do what you've done uh, because you've justified yourself. And sometimes you even move into self-deception where you always think you're right no matter what. And so, instead of rebound, it's self-justification and self-deception. And I got a call today saying, well, can't this apply to even people who haven't been abused? And the answer is yes. Uh, Most of these do apply to the person who has not been abused, except for certain things which are special for the one who has been abused because they use it in childhood, such as repression. Most people who have never been abused and have not uh, uh, been able to use these defense mechanisms never use repression, and they never use dissociation. They also uh, never have plus M sharing the misery of the abuser. But uh, others do have uh, things related to the same mechanisms, except it's not a defense mechanism for them. It's simply living in the cosmic system. And for the ones who have not been abused, we have a separate system, one that uh, follows more closely with the person who is uh, simply in carnality and the one who continues in carnality, and that is the eight stages of reversionism. The eight stages of reversionism are as follows. First of all, reaction and distraction. Never been abused, but they come in contact as a believer with the Word of God, and they either react to the Word of God, meaning they don't like what's being taught, they don't like the Word of God stepping on their toes, so they react to it. That's the first stage of reversionism. Also in the first stage, you can have distraction. Distracted by a football game distracted by homework, distracted by the things that you think are more important in life. Nothing is more important than the Word of God. Now, of course, people can get this on their own on the Internet, and uh, a lot of people do get it on the Internet, and that's uh, perfectly fine, Uh, but uh, I know how things go. Most people don't even bother, and I know they won't because they won't even be insulted by this message. Otherwise, they'd be very insulted and probably tell me about it later. But they won't, so I'll just speak freely. And for those of you on the Internet, well, I'm glad you're there. Uh, You're probably the only ones that are consistent. And in fact, uh, eventually, we are, except for the ones here, and in fact, we are eventually going to put something on the website for conferences for those people around the country, if there are any, who wish to have a conference, they can request one and I'll go there. And so the first one, reaction and distraction. Reaction and distraction. Then the second one, a frantic search for happiness. And a lot of people this Friday night are out having a frantic search for happiness, looking for happiness in money, looking for happiness in some type of stimulation. Well, have fun. Then we have Operation Boomerang. Operation Boomerang. And that is where you... uh, You've been searching for happiness. It's just as if you've thrown the boomerang out uh, looking to hit the target of happiness, yet it comes back and smacks you in the forehead where it should be. And therefore, you go under divine discipline. 
so Operation Boomerang. Number three. Now this applies to anyone. These are the eight stages of reversionism. And of course, we've been talking about uh, child abuse. And they have a similar form, but it's different in that it uses a lot of defense mechanisms that are related to psychology. This is not. This is simply the cosmic system. Then after Operation Boomerang, there's emotional revolt of the soul. The person's emotions take over the soul and their emotions become their God. This is where a lot of people go into the Pentecostal movement. And they run up and down aisles. They froth at the mouth. They do everything that is not related to the Christian way of life whatsoever. And therefore they fall under uh, very extreme discipline. So number four, emotional revolt of the soul. Number five. Now, number five uh, has been stated as being permanent negative volition, but I'm going to change that up a bit because it's not really permanent yet. Uh, people who have gone this far can still recover, so I call abiding negative volition. Uh, you will abide in negative volition until uh, times get so rough and so tough that you might rebound. And I can say that because the next one is blackout of the soul. And so you even, you even haven't forgotten all the doctrine. You might even still remember rebound under abiding negative volition, uh, what was known as uh, permanent negative volition. Well, it's permanent so long as you let it be permanent at this point. Then you move on to blackout of the soul. Blackout of the soul. And that is where all the doctrine you've ever heard is forgotten. You forget all about it because you've missed too many Bible classes because uh, you thought something else was more important, that's reaction or distraction, one or the other, and therefore you begin to forget things. Your rate of uh, forgetting exceeds your rate of learning, and the memory uh, system that we have is very important. And uh, my pastor's losing his memory, and uh, he had one of the greatest minds since the Apostle Paul, and so if he can lose his memory, anyone can through a disease, that shows the importance of it and the importance of us to never forget it but to keep on uh, pushing with doctrine, to keep on going day in and day out, uh, hour after hour even in some cases. That's to avoid blackout of the soul where you forget doctrines. Doctrines that you might have remembered last week. If you haven't been to church in a week, you forget them. And that eventuates in blackout of the soul. Everything you've ever learned is forgotten. Then you move to scar tissue of the soul scar tissue of the soul. And that's another reason why I changed number five to abiding negative volition instead of permanent, because uh, a permanent negative volition really comes after scar tissue of the soul. And that is when uh, you get to a point where you have so much scar tissue, you're, you're at a point of no return. And there is a point of no return, just as in, the, uh, in World War II, they sent out the bombing raid to Japan. And uh, there's a point at which a plane can go so far and it's past the point of return in which they'll run out of gas if they try to get back. So what they did is flew right over Japan and crashed into China instead. And some of them lived, some of them died. I think they even showed that on the movie Pearl Harbor. But uh, we have um, scar tissue of the soul. And once you start to build up scar tissue, uh, then it becomes more difficult to learn Bible doctrine. Then number eight, the eighth stage of reversionism is reverse process reversionism. And that's where you simply go all the way back through this whole system all over again, and it continues to build scar tissue upon scar tissue. You continue to have blackout of the soul. You continue to be negative toward doctrine. You continue to be under the emotional revolt of the soul. You continue to react or be distracted from doctrine. You continue to have a frantic search for happiness and you continue to get smacked on the head with the boomerang, but it doesn't wake you up. And so you die, eventually, the sin face to face with death. So that's for everyone. But we're dealing with something different, the defense mechanisms. And the defense mechanisms, uh, the way they are listed, while some of us can suffer from self-justification and self-deception without ever being abused, that's true, and we can suffer from self-absorption without ever being abused, but the problem with the person who has been abused, uh, they have a strong volitional tendency, one way or the other. If you've been abused sexually, you are either going to have a strong tendency for the defense mechanisms, 
or you're going to latch on to the solution and have a strong positive volition toward doctrine. One or the other. There's no in-between for the person who has been abused. They have too many things to overcome. And therefore, they either go all out in self-justification and self-deception, go all out in self-absorption. Also, they repress things and dissociate. That's something that a lot of people who have never been abused never do. They never repress it, although it's possible in psychosis. If you're in the eight stages of reversionism long enough, you too can develop repression and dissociation because you're falling into neurosis and psychosis, which is part of your punishment. But for the abused person, usually they have a tendency for psychosis immediately after the abuse, even in childhood. And some people in childhood have become psychotic due to child abuse. And that doesn't happen with people who haven't been abused unless they have a physiological problem, such as uh, one of the people I've described before who received too many steroids in the hospital and then went nuts. So there are physiological things that can happen but we're dealing in general, and we're dealing with the majority of the population. And the majority of people who have been abused use the defense mechanisms. And some of them recover by using the problem-solving devices. So the question I got was a good one, and it's given me a chance to clarify it. Yes, uh, you can uh, possess some of these defense mechanisms if you're in reversionism. And that is the truth. However, uh, if you have been abused, you automatically use these things and it's something you must break from because you do it in childhood. If you had normal faith perception and if you have uh, never been abused and you grow up, you're not going to have that tendency toward self-justification and self-deception nor will you have the tendency toward self-absorption or repression or dissociation. And not, you won't have a tendency even toward self-righteousness or projection. And while you may have human viewpoint orientation, th these things you just will not uh, use as a child, yet the abused child uses them right off. It's their only way of defense. So if they carry it into adulthood, this is what occurs. Number one, rebound. Instead of rebound, self-justification. Number two, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Instead of being filled with God the Holy Spirit, they're self-absorbed. And even if they rebound, they're so self-absorbed, they go right back and under the concept of carnality. Then we have the faith rest drill. And that is a problem-solving device in which you can uh, claim a promise and mix it with faith, in which you can leave the people who have wronged you into the Supreme uh, Court of Heaven but instead you use repression and dissociation. You repress the bad things that are happening. You dissociate yourself from the bad things that are happening. And yesterday I gave you an example of Scarlett O'Hara. O'Hara, I believe that's her last O'Hara. And um, her husband at the time, the guy with the mustache, do you remember his name? Uh, uh, oh, he's famous, uh, the handsome guy with the mustache, Red, Red Butler, that's it. So. Uh, Red Butler's there, and uh, he says, well, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And then she says, well, I won't think about this until later. That's dissociation. She, sim she simply dissociated herself from the problem. And that is a sign of definitely an abused person or an abused soul. Just completely and totally dissociate yourself from the problem so that you don't even worry with it and don't even bother with it. But that's not the faith rest drill. It does work in terms of uh, uh, staving off the pain for the moment, but it always comes back. And then we have number four, grace orientation. And if you're not grace-oriented, you will move into self-righteousness and projection. And a lot of times, the young lady who has been abused, uh, she becomes very self-righteous uh, during the week when she's not uh, committing lascivious sins. But then on the weekend, if she gets drunk, does drugs, commits a lascivious sin, she moves from self-righteousness to self-pity, and oftentimes completely disregards the fact that she has sinned and uses projection in which she, in which she projects her sins onto others and she doesn't even consider herself to be a, a bad person whatsoever. And just because she sins doesn't make her a bad person, but that's the way she looks at life. So there's a difference here, grace orientation versus self-righteousness. Now, it's true anyone who doesn't get to grace orientation, especially legalists, they will move to self-righteousness, and oftentimes if they go far enough in legalism, they'll go nuts and start using projection. So really, this... 
this does apply to anyone, especially if they've gone so deep into reversionism that they just simply go nuts. And some people have never been abused, but they go psychotic, as per Dysukos, which is mentioned in James, and that is, and they develop some of the same uh, principles that the abused person develops. But the abused person developed them in childhood. These other people uh, developed it later in life. The abused person immediately uses these things. The one who has never been abused, they develop these things over time if they remain in reversionism, and that's because they've split from reality and moved into Daisukas. They have now become, and Daisukas, uh, by the way, uh, it's a biblical term that was written way before psychologists even ever started looking at some of these things. And Daisukas means double soul. It's really referring to a split personality. And the Bible discovered it even in the Old Testament. There are Hebrew words that line, uh, line up with uh, Daisukas, in which uh, they uh, described splitting or split personalities, even in the Old Testament. And that happened with the Exodus generation. And so if you remain in reversionism long enough, whether abused or not, you'll go crazy. But for the person who has been abused, they immediately pick up these defense mechanisms and immediately use them as a child. When, and that is one of the times when children really don't need to be using these things. They should be learning by faith perception. But the abuser has destroyed faith perception. Therefore, they fall under this immediate psychotic system. And it is a system for psychosis a system for someone who has split from reality. Now, as a child, they must do so in order to protect themselves. But they carry this into adulthood. So I hope I'm making it clear the difference now uh, between the fact that, uh, yes, we can all fall under the defense mechanisms if we all go crazy from lack of learning Bible doctrine or from using reversionism instead. And so now we move to uh, a personal sense of destiny. Well, of course, doctrinal orientation. Instead of doctrinal orientation, there is uh, human viewpoint orientation. Then we move to a personal sense of destiny, number six. And that's where we develop spiritual self-esteem. On the other hand, there's human self-esteem. And from the, what the psychologist will do, if you meet one, is tell you you must build up your human self-esteem. You must think highly of yourself. You see, what happens in many abusive situations is the young person falls under a uh, something called the inferiority complex. They, they lose all normal self-esteem. And they think of themselves as inferior all the time. And therefore, the psychologist notices this problem. And they're right to notice it, but their solution is all wrong. And they say, what you need to do is feel good about yourself. And when you look in the mirror, don't think of yourself as ugly. Repeat to yourself a hundred times that I am beautiful. I am beautiful. And they used to have some man on a Saturday Night Live make fun of that stuff. And uh, I forget what, what that was all about. It was silliness, but it's uh, quite funny because it actually... Um, it actually illustrates absurdity by being absurd. And this uh, person would be absurd in which they would uh, have a TV show and say, I love myself, etc. I'm beautiful, I love myself, sexy, something else. But anyway, that's how he would build himself up, and he was a real nerd. But uh, this is human self-esteem, and he was looking for approbation lust, approval lust from others. And that doesn't carry you. But on the other hand, a personal sense of destiny, you knowing that you're royal family of God, you knowing that you have the greatest spiritual life ever with uh, all of the things related to the spiritual life, the ten problem-solving devices, the three spiritual skills, four spiritual mechanics, having all those things that they've never had in the past, and knowing that you have those things, and loving those things, you develop spiritual self-esteem in which you don't care what people really think about you. There's no approbation lust. And it's not dependent on human self-esteem. Uh, you know you are the way you are by the grace of God. And so really it's free from arrogance. And this spiritual self-esteem is totally free from arrogance, while human self-esteem is preoccupation with self and complete arrogance. Then we move to personal love for God the Father. 
and we have that is uh, we're moving into the higher realm, the higher echelon of the ten problem solving devices. But instead of personal love for God the Father, the abused person, even in childhood, uh, begins to develop human idols because uh, the, the abuser has abused them and maybe they've been from an abusive family and then uh, someone else in their childhood is very nice to them, so they make an idol out of that person. And oftentimes, uh, uh, someone who has been abused, it, instead of uh, making an idol out of God the Father, they make an idol out of their aunt. Or they make idols out of their grandparents. Or they make idols out of uh, someone else in their periphery. And therefore they get older and they see the feet of clay of these idols that they've created. And therefore they assume the whole world's against them, including the former idols which they have created. And then we move to impersonal love for all mankind. And instead of impersonal love for all mankind, the abused person has impersonal hate for all mankind. This is something unique to the abused person because they are maladjusted to life, they have an inferiority complex, and therefore they automatically resist people. They automatically resist relationships because they're scared of being hurt. And uh, if they're, uh, and usually they go out all out in approbation lust, but then that fails them, and therefore eventually they just simply have impersonal hate for all mankind. And while in their youth they were very outgoing and looking for approbation lust, uh, they don't get what they want, and then later on in life they become more of a recluse. These are people who have been abused and they never get married because they couldn't handle such a situation, and they usually end up as a, a hermits uh, in life. And then we have a plus H, sharing the happiness of God, and on the other side is what we're going to study today, plus M, sharing the misery of the abuser. And that's what we're going to study today with the doctrine of the millstone transfer. And then, of course, number 10, occupation with Christ. And this can go for abused person or person who hasn't been abused, occupation with environment or people. And if you're not a learning Bible doctrine, you will eventually become occupied with your environment and become occupied with people rather than occupied with Christ. So now to the doctrine of the millstone transfer. And this is exactly where I got number nine of the defense mechanism plus M, sharing the misery of the abuser. Point one, the millstone judgment belongs to the abuser. The millstone judgment belongs to the abuser, to those guilty of child abuse. The judgment does not belong to the victim. In Matthew 18.6, the millstone applies to the abuser, not the abused or the abusee, I guess you could say. But the millstone judgment belongs to the abuser, to those guilty of child abuse, and the judgment does not belong to the victim. Point two, but when the victim reacts through defense mechanism, and as a child, if you're abused as a child, you will. It's not when, but you will. But when the victim reacts through defense mechanisms, there are inevitable repercussions. These repercussions include garbage in the subconscious or garbage in uh, developing in your stream of conscience. Freud called it the unconscious that later became known as the subconscious. It actually is the stream of conscious as consciousness as the Bible describes it. Garbage in the stream of consciousness. Then the function of the arrogance and emotional complex of sins. That's why so many abused uh, children become unstable, even as children, and they carry that instability straight into adulthood. And uh, one minute they're high on life, and the next minute they are, are feeling terrible and depressed oftentimes developing such disorders as bipolar disorder, in which they're flying high one moment and then completely and totally depressed the next moment. And on that uh, movie uh, in which uh, they had the baby face Nelson, uh, he was definitely a case, uh, oh brother where art thou, uh, showed baby face, face Nelson and they definitely indicated that he was bipolar. High on life one moment and then after after he was so high on life, he got very depressed and moped around. And uh, 
he had, definitely he had bipolar disorder and was probably, not necessarily, but probably abused as a child, but it did not excuse him from what he did. Now, the victim of child abuse, uh, this is what happens. Because of the fact that they develop garbage in the subconscious or stream of consciousness, guess what? The abuser does the same. And because they develop the function of arrogance and emotional complex of sins, guess what? The abuser does the same. So what happens is the victim of child abuse often shares the millstone with the evil person who initiates such abuse. So the principle for those who have been abused is this. Never share the millstone with your abuser. And the tendency is often to do so. In fact, the tendency is often to imitate the behavior of the abuser. Never share the millstone with your abuser. Point three. Defense mechanisms are delivered... Uh, the defense mechanisms, excuse me, the defense mechanisms that delivered the abused child destroy the adult. And this is an important principle because if you see a child using defense mechanisms, that's not a point at which you can berate them. And oftentimes this occurs. A child will have some type of reaction from abuse. The parents don't understand why because they're not aware of it. And therefore, instead of noticing what's going on in defense mechanisms, they berate them for using the defense mechanisms. And they don't understand why their child is acting the way their child is acting, so they condemn them. Uh, maybe the child acts out sexually at four or five years old. Well, guess what? A child should not be doing that at four or five years old, but instead of berating them and making them feel even guiltier, then uh, you should recognize something's wrong. There's, uh, they're using defense mechanisms. In fact, they're imitating the abuser, and uh, instead of shaming them, you need to really start to investigate and see what's happening. And uh, it's common sense to me, but I've had all of this doctrine given to me. But a lot of parents who've never heard this stuff will just uh, uh, shame on you for doing that or doing this. Well, when you're five and four and five years old, if you're acting that way, usually you're acting out because of something that's occurred. Defense mechanisms that delivered the abused child destroy the adult. For example, here we'll get some examples of some of the things I've been talking about. Too bad people aren't here to notice it, but I'll keep going. I'm not going to slow down for anybody. For example, dissociation results in multiple personality disorders. Dissociation results in multiple personality disorders. And that's very true. I've actually seen people with multiple personality disorders and it's one of the strangest things I've ever seen uh, because uh, one moment they uh, have the personality of tough person and they issue orders, do this, do that, and do the other. And then they move into the personality of uh, being like a baby and they use a baby voice. And uh, it's really weird, but that is the result of defense mechanism. They dissociate them themselves from the uh, situation in which they actually become a different person. Uh, they become the, a person who hasn't been affected by these things. Very strange. But it's actually miraculous because it's how God set up the system for children so that if they were to be abused, they could handle it. And then later on in life, they can get with doctrine. But if they don't get with doctrine, these things continue. And they continue to dissociate as adults. Therefore, they have multiple personality disorders their whole life. It's sad, but remember, they have volition and they've made the choice. Then we have denial. And denial results in projection. Denial, in fact, is uh, what some people do is they deny that they're ever wrong. And some people, even knowing that they're wrong, they'll say, well, I have been wrong, but I'll never admit it. And they always deny ever being wrong and it actually irks them to ever admit wrong and that's odd to me but people just say, I'm not going to admit I'm wrong and this denial results in projection and in, and uh, that the person might become violent or the person might become very bitter and then they project that uh, violence and bitterness on others 
They might simply all of a sudden go nuts and start wailing on somebody and, and beating them and then say uh, to themselves, uh, and then the person says, what are you doing? You're crazy. And then they project it and say, no, you're crazy. You're the one who's hurt me, etc. That's part of projection. And so psychotherapy in some cases is helpful. Uh, it's not helpful in terms of solving the problem, but it's helpful in this way. It's not going to solve the problem, but it is helpful in bringing out the trauma out of the subconscious. In other words, you've denied, uh, you've denied it, you've repressed it, you've dissociated yourself from it. In fact, you've nearly forgotten it. And in some cases, people completely forget the terrible abuse that they went through. And psychotherapy has developed ways in which they bring it out of the subconscious. Sometimes they even use hypnosis and bring it out. I don't know how reliable it is, but sometimes it has happened in which uh, they'll go into a hypnotic session and the th psychotherapist delves into their subconscious or what was used to be called the unconscious and pull it right out so that the person will begin remembering what had happened in the past. And, and what this does, it, it brings to the conscious mind. Uh, it comes to your consciousness where it can be dealt with. And, and that is the only uh, helpful thing in, in it is the fact that, okay, you're not going to project or deny anymore and you're not going to have personal uh, multiple personalities because now you know what's wrong. Now you see what happened. Before you didn't even know you were abused, but then it's brought out and you say, well, my goodness, I was abused. Then you can deal with it. But in most cases, what happens is psych, psych, uh, psychotherapy brings it out and then the person freaks out and sometimes commits suicide or jumps off a building, or uh, and uh, because they the reason why they uh, uh, repressed it and the reason why they dissociated themselves from it was because they couldn't handle it. And then when it comes out, they still can't handle it. So oftentimes it's tragedy because the psychotherapist has no way to say, "Well, now apply these problem-solving devices." The only true way to get out of it is to get on medicine and to learn Bible doctrine. And then if the memories do flood back, if they don't, there's no problem if you're getting with the spiritual life. But if they do flood back, at least now you have something to deal with it. If it happens before you have any doctrine, you're going to go, it, it's going to actually make the problem even worse. And so the principle for the abused person is that you cannot look back, you cannot go back for justification of the actions of your old sin nature. And many people have justified their homosexuality or their homosexual trend because they have, uh, well, they well, if you have a trend that way, that's one thing. If you act on it, it's another. And they'll blame their homosexuality on uh, the abuse. And while it did have an impact and an influence on you, you have volition. Therefore, you cannot justify any sin uh, be or any action of your old sin nature based on the past abuses. Point four. Millstones of your life must be removed by the function of the ten problem-solving devices. Millstones of your life must be removed by the function of the ten problem-solving devices. The combination of the faith rest drill and doctrinal orientation is necessary to remove the millstone of guilt Guilt is a terrible millstone. Therefore, you must develop the faith rest drill. You must get to a point of doctrinal orientation, and that's the only point at which you're going to remove guilt from your life. And if you do not remove guilt from your life, it's just as if it's a millstone around your neck and it is drowning you. Guilt is uh, a terrible emotional sin. Yet guilt in Christianity today is somehow uh, elevated. Oh, you must feel guilty and walk down the aisle and weep tears of repentance, which means have a guilt reaction. Everybody here, if you want to be saved, feel guilty because you are an unbeliever and you've, uh, or actually feel guilty because you're a sinner. Where who's not? Even believers are sinners. And it's disgusting the lack of knowledge in Christendom today. And that's why our country's suffering. And it's going to suffer all the more until people get serious with the Word of God. I guess it's going to take a little more than $3 gas prices. 
ah, oh, maybe God will bump it up to 6 or $12 eventually to where you can't afford to do anything except sit here and listen to the Word of God. It'll happen. So I'm done yelling about it. So, uh, point five. When the victim reacts, when the victim reacts, the victim gets a piece of the millstone. When you react to the person who has abused you, you get a piece of the millstone. Therefore, you'll be off balance all of your life until you learn how to take, take it out of your life. That is, take the millstone and throw it away. The only way you can do that is, is to uh, develop a spiritual strength from learning Bible doctrine and from developing the flat line on your soul. And the only way to do that is daily uh, cognition, daily perception, application, daily perception, metabolization, and application of doctrine. That's the only way to get rid of the millstone if you've been abused. And if you haven't been abused, it's the only way to break uh, free from reversionism. If you miss one day of doctrine, you're in distraction to the Word of God. You're in the first stage of reversionism. And I would be correct in calling you a reversionist. One day! I don't miss a day of study. I can't remember the last time I did miss a day of study. At all. That's because I'm not in reversionism. But a lot of people are teetering with it and flirting with it. Have fun with it because times are going to get so rough because of uh, people's uh, uh, distraction and people's uh, indifference to the Word of God. Nothing's more important than the Word of God. Yet I'm preaching to the choir because you're here, they're not. And they'll never hear this. Uh, maybe I'll say this when they get here, but then I'll be criticized for it all over again, of course. I don't care. That's my job. Shepherd, pastor, teacher is a shepherd, and you knock people, the sheep, in the head when they get a little, uh, out of, well, not necessarily out of line, but distracted by the weeds of life. Well, go strangle yourself. That's what you're doing and you don't even know. But who am I talking to? So we have reaction and distraction as part. And if you're distracted from the Word, if you think a TV show is more important, if you think a football game is more important, if you think anything is more important than to set aside one measly hour a day for the Word of God, you're definitely in reversionism, the first stage of it. And you're, you're immediately, as a result, moving to a frantic search for happiness. And then there'll be Operation Boomerang and it's going to smack you in the forehead and that's when people usually start to straggle their way back in. Their butts are bruised by divine discipline and now they're back uh, ready to get an instant solution. Well, it's not instant, it's daily. And then as soon as uh, things get better, back out they go. It's, uh, really, it's really sad, especially when I see the state of our country and when I see that uh, positive volition even on the part of one extra person, positive volition even on the part of one or two extra people can uh, deliver a nation. Moses delivered two million. It's really sad that they don't understand the impact that they could have. Terribly sad. Well, I'm going to keep going anyway. So through the function of the problem-solving devices, the millstone you share with guilty persons can be buried forever with the abuser. And where is the abuser, by the way? Matthew 18, 6, buried in the depths of the sea. It's the only way to deal with it. Now, I know a lot of times in reaction to abuse, uh, you will try, seek to destroy the abuser. Don't bother. God will destroy the abuser. Don't get in his way. Don't get in God's way, that is. If you get in God's way, the only thing that's going to happen to you is you too are going to have a millstone around your neck. Step out of the way and let God deal with the abuser. He will. He'll destroy him. So move on with your life. This is uh, Actually, that was point one of a whole different type of subject. Uh, so point one, through the function of problem-solving devices, the millstone you share with guilty persons can be buried forever with the abuser. Point two, move on with your life and let the Supreme Court of Heaven deal with the guilty. 
Move on with your life and let the Supreme Court of Heaven deal with the guilty. Forget those things that are behind and reach out toward those things which are in front of you and press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know this from Philippians. We've had that verse before. Forget those things or disregard those things that are behind and reach out toward those things which are in front of you and press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is the mark of the prize? To reach play Roma to Theu. How do you reach play Roma to Theu? Daily perception, metabolization, and application of Bible doctrine. Not hodgepodge. Hodgepodge doesn't cut it. You lose your rewards. You and you alone are the only one who can live your own spiritual life. This is point three. You and you alone are the only one who can live your spiritual life. No one else can live the spiritual life for you. Therefore, move on with your life and let God deal with the guilty. God will deal with them a lot better than you ever could. Much, uh, Actually, probably even harsher than you could ever even imagine. There's no harsher language our Lord could have even used than to say to be buried at sea, meaning no proper burial, meaning no headstone, meaning the person is removed from society. Therefore, move on and let God deal with the guilty. Do not react to injustice. And this goes not only for the abused person, but for everyone. We're all going to receive injustices in life, whether it be under system testing, whether it be under any type of testing, whether it be by legalists constantly nipping at us, or whether it be by people who are reacting and distracting, or whether, or even if it's by people who are distracted by things in life and are insulted when they're called out on it. So you and you alone are the only one who can live your own spiritual life. No one else can live it for you. Therefore, move on with your life and let God deal with the guilty. Do not react to injustice. Never allow child abuse in your past to drag you down to the level of the abuser. The abuser has a giant millstone around his neck. And if you constantly look in the past and if you constantly berate the person who abused you, if you constantly rip them apart and try to rip them down, you're trying to take the place of God and you are sharing in, you are sharing the misery of the abuser. You're not happy ripping that person apart. You cannot build your happiness on someone else's uh, unhappiness. And I still can't get over the fact that this president that we have is one of the most hated presidents, not by the majority of people, but the vitriolic hate is so strong among those who simply hate him that uh, they want to build their happiness on his unhappiness. They even use a hurricane to try to destroy a president, as if uh, the face of the president was on the hurricane as it was uh, plowing through New Orleans. My goodness. It's really sickening. And then uh, people getting up... Uh, you can tell the president was racist because uh, the hurricane hit New Orleans in the poor area. Come on, how much credit do you give the man? On the one hand, you say he's an idiot, and then on the other hand, you say he has control over a hurricane. You're so contradictory, you're stupid. You're in the cosmic system. I'm irritated. So, uh, point four. The, rea- the reaction to child abuse has an overpowering sin nature implication in the life of the innocent victim. The reaction to child abuse has an overpowering sin nature implication in the life of the innocent victim. And that's because they react to it. It's almost a natural thing for the child to react to it. Therefore, it is an overpowering sin nature implication means simply that uh, they're going to have a strong tendency toward the defense mechanism. Just as I told you, the abused person is either going to go strong for doctrine or strong for the defense mechanisms. There's no really in between. You see, under the eight stages of reversionism, number one, reaction and distraction. For the abused person, distraction is rarely the issue. It's always reaction. They reacted to the child abuser. They're going to react to doctrine if they don't like it. And the issue is rarely, rarely distraction for the abused person. 
Not that they'd get distracted from it. they just react to it and it'll never go back. It's very difficult for abused people to ever get with the Word of God. they got a chip on their shoulder. they got a big piece of the millstone wrapped around their neck. So the solution to child abuse is twofold. First of all, regeneration. For the unbeliever, believe in Christ. Followed by post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation, or using the post-salvation spiritual dynamics. Using the ten problem-solving devices instead of the defense mechanisms. Using the two power options, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and Operation Z. Using the three spiritual skills. Using the four spiritual mechanics. Using those things that allows the person to grow in grace and in knowledge, and they forget the past or disregard it and throw it in the sea. So the survivors of child abuse come in two categories. As I was telling you, there's no in-between. There are simply two categories of child-abused people. Number one, those who survive without the divine dinosphere. Or you could describe it as those who survive without God's help, but none of us breathe without God's help. That would be a bit misleading. But it's those who survive without the divine dinosphere. Those who survive without spiritual dynamics. Those who survive without the ten problem-solving devices. What happens with them is they destroy their lives by use of the defense mechanism. Dissociation, repression, denial, projection. Now, this gets down to the actual defense mechanisms and that there's four of them that are actually uh, how they... Now, of course, I gave you a listing of ten, and those are offshoots of defense mechanisms, but these are, this is the meat of defense mechanisms, and that's dissociation. And remember, dissociation often results in split personalities, multiple split personalities. And usually the person with split personality just doesn't have one other, maybe about five or ten other. Sometimes so many it's hard to distinguish. They distinguish it because they're dissociating from one to another. Then repression. Repression is definitely used in uh, the early childhood in which you simply forget the abuse altogether. Sometimes people have been known to forget certain segments of their lives. Maybe ages uh, three to six, whereas I can remember being in uh, kindergarten and I can remember being in first grade and all. If you use repression, you forget that. I even remember my teacher's names, as I told you the other day. But if you've been, if you use repression, you forget whole segments of your life and bury them. Then there's denial. And denial is in which it's one of it's it's an odd thing, and you actually it's part of self deception really, and it's part of uh, well you uh, you believe you're well you're always right, you you go into denial when you're wrong, and you say I'm not wrong, I'm always right. It's a strange thing that occurs, all related to psychology, and then projection, even stranger projection in which you simply project your flaws onto someone else. And uh, this has psych uh, psychological implica implications because uh, a psychologist will tell you right off that if a husband suddenly becomes... Now, this isn't true in all cases. Uh, of course not. Uh, but this is what psychology says. They say if a husband suddenly becomes out of the blue... I mean, if they've always been a jealous person, they've always been a jealous person. But if out of the blue the husband's been all right and then maybe the, the fifth or sixth year into the marriage they suddenly become jealous of everything, uh, the psychologist will say, well, he's using projection. He's actually the one who's committed adultery and now is projecting it onto his wife and vice versa. And uh, that's happened, not in all cases, but that's an example of projection. So the first category, those who survive outside of the spiritual dynamics. The second category, those who survive with God's help or inside the unique spiritual life, inside the divine dinosphere, utilizing the ten problem-solving devices and utilizing the spiritual dynamics. They are the believers, therefore, who do use the spiritual dynamics. And they use divine power available in the spiritual life. They use the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and they use the Word of God. 
They utilize metabolized doctrine circulating in the stream of consciousness to form and use the ten problem-solving devices. So those are the two categories. There's no in-between. Therefore, the abused person will use defense mechanisms. And again, I'm making a slight distinction between those who have been abused and those who haven't, because those who haven't been abused, for example, the person who hasn't been abused, if they react or are distracted from the Word of God, uh, let's say for two, three years, that doesn't mean they're automatically going to move to the defense mechanisms. They'll use certain offshoots of it, such as self-justification, self-deception, and they'll be self-absorbed, but they won't use repression and they won't use dissociation and they won't uh, become and they won't go into having split personalities. However, if the non-abused person moves deep enough outside the spiritual life or moves deep enough into reversionism and develops enough scar tissue on the soul, then maybe later on in life they will develop repression and dissociation and start to bring those out because the divine punishment will become so severe that that will be the only way they, they handle it themselves. And so uh, these things are with us really all our lives. But for the abused child, they come out early and they stay with them the rest of their life unless they get with the doctrine. For the one who's not abused, it doesn't come out until they... Uh, have a traumatic experience, divine discipline would definitely be a traumatic experience. And so it definitely occurs for the person in reversionism as well. And, and actually the defense mechanism mechanisms are something that not only the abused child uses, but it's something that all psychotic or neurotic people use. So even if you've never been abused and you go psychotic because of your rejection of the Word of God, or because of your neglect of the Word of God. If you go psychotic, if you go into it and become an emotional nutcase and have nervous breakdowns, etc., you too will start to use the defense mechanism. But for the person who has been abused as a child, they immediately use them. That's the difference. Not much difference, except that as a child you shouldn't be using them, but uh, they obviously come out when something traumatic like that happens. Now, uh, Sunday, we'll begin with Matthew 18.7. And actually, uh, and this is funny, we're getting to Matthew 18.7, and this is actually going to be the introductory principles. We've uh, scratched the surface, in other words. And Matthew 18.7 actually begins the uh, true meat of child abuse. And we'll get to the Greek word skondalon, and we'll get to all types of things. And those of you who weren't here... Well, you're going to be way behind. Too bad. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.